going beyond the headlines. Asking the questions you want answered. Exploring government policies and how they impact you. We are delving deeper. Good evening and welcome to Delving Deeper. I am Sonolala. Joining us on the show this evening is Minister of National Security, the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines. Good evening, Minister Hines. We did have you on the show in late 2023, and I did say then we needed to have you back very soon to discuss some other issues. Um, so said, so done. Good evening, Mr. Lala. The pleasure is indeed mine to have contributed to keeping your promise to your large viewership and listenership. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. I want to start off with Carnival. Carnival is just about four weeks away, and I know uh, stakeholder discussions have already begun. Um, among other things being discussed is security for Carnival. We understand that one of those stakeholder meetings took place last Thursday. Can you tell us about the preparation so far? The government of Trinidad and Tobago understands quite well the cultural, the social, and most of all, the economic impact of Carnival on Trinidad and Tobago. We understand how important it is, particularly since it requires large numbers of people to be gathered in the same space, and we have many tourists and visitors here for that period. So the question of security is, of course, paramount in our minds. And in this regard, we gathered the stakeholders. This is not new. We do that on an annual basis. On this occasion, we did it a little earlier than usual, where we came together with the NCC, the National Carnival Commission, responsible for carnivals all over Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, the promoters and the event managers, they were represented at the meeting. The Ministry of, the Minister of Tourism Culture and the Arts represented his ministry, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the municipal police, because they are present in every single one of the 14 corporations around Trinidad, and um, yours truly, and officials of the Ministry of National Security. So we had this stakeholder platform to discuss issues of security, particularly since as we approach Carnival, and in preparatory stage, the, there was an incident outside of the Queen's Park Savannah, and it created a lot of uh, trauma among members of the national community, and so much so that BPTT, an international corporate giant operating in Trinidad and Tobago, which had plans to support the carnival event at the Queen's Park Savannah for the duration of the season. It announced a withdrawal. I am happy to inform you that we have had conversations with BPTT and last evening its chairman informed me that they have rethought their position and have decided to re-engage with NCC in the plans that they had on. On this occasion, more deeply, more widely, they have decided to expand their sponsorship and involvement in the carnival. Coming out of that stakeholder meeting where we were able to give them the assurance of the many things we have done to ensure peace and safety and enjoyment and security in the run-up to carnival and, of course, following it. With regards to BPTT, what specific have they asked for in terms of uh, security and so on? Have they asked for Well, anything? we would have uh, in, in, informed them that security and safety is our business quite naturally on an ongoing basis. Carnival happens to pass through that responsibility, if I can put it that way. So we assured them that is, as is quite normal, uh, police officers leave is curtailed for Carnival. So by Carnival Friday, most of the police officers, except if out of the country or sick, are out on duty across Trinidad and Tobago. That's quite normal. But most of all, we were able to point out to them that we have done a little more than that. We have had successful, safe management of Carnival for decades, for the history of it in Trinidad and Tobago. And we assured them that that will continue. On this occasion, 
we are making greater use of the technology, that is to say the CCTV camera systems. On this occasion, we have deployed some specialist units of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. That is to say units like the CID, Criminal Investigation Department, that is to say the Garden Emergency Branch, the Interagency Task Force, they have been specially uh, deployed around the country for the carnival uh, season and the, follow, and the run up to it. Of course, we also indicated to them that we have had consultation with the Promoters Association so we know what their schedule will be for the season. And we have even agreed to sign an MOU with them where in that MOU we have agreed to standardize safety and security measures for all of the events that they are promoting in the run up to and inside of the season. So these things we have decided as well to deploy many more officers of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force so as to create greater presence and responsiveness in the carnival season. Again on this year, I am approaching the cabinet next week to get a ban on glass bottles at all of these public events. Not new, but we'll be doing that again. All of these things and more designed to create presence and a feeling of safety and security for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Our visitors, particularly those who uh, participate in carnival. And we are also mindful that while some participate in carnival, there are many who go to the beaches and campsites around the country. So we have special arrangements in place for presence and patrol at those well-known campsites to ensure that the entire country during the carnival season is policed and safety and security is greater assured. For those who may not know, how often do we have these stakeholder engagements and how much uh, of these stakeholder engagements do we have before carnival? Well, law enforcement and the service that we offer through the Ministry of National Security is really focused on, intended for, and all about the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And the people are represented in different ways, whether in the NGO community, FED promoters, the faith-based organizations, wherever they are. So we engage all of the time. We keep a very opening, uh, an open, sorry, and a listening air for all stakeholders representing different sectors of the community. So to answer your question, we meet quite regularly with stakeholders. For example, I think it was a few months ago, I, I met with the contractors, the businessmen, the people who actually carry out the development work under the guidance of some state agencies like the HDC and UDCOT and NIDCO and so on. I had an engagement with them, along with the Commission of Police, the Chief of Defense Staff and so on, responding to their concerns that their project sites were being attacked, intimidation put upon them by criminals demanding work, demanding money, extortion, and all kinds of things, calling them on their private phones, calling them at home. There was an incident where um, some of these criminals even went to the home of a businessman and attacked and beat and assault his family. So in response to that, we engaged with these stakeholders and we had present every unit of the police service that would respond to particular aspects of crime. For example, the CID and they would deal with the extortion bit. Those who would call would fall into the attention of the cybercrime unit. And we had every one of these units that may have been mandated to give attention to different aspects of that criminality present. And again, we worked a formula out and um, we've maintained that our presence on their, some of their job sites. And since then, I haven't heard too many complaints. But of course, the thing is not like stop start. It's an evolution. It's ongoing because, as you know, crime is a, a function of the wicked, selfish, evil, greedy, cravages nature of us human beings. And uh, we are like that. 
and therefore law enforcement has to respond to this on an ongoing basis. And I want to take the opportunity to say to your viewers and listeners, I know you are traumatized. I know you are alarmed at what is happening and you quite rightly should be. But understand that this is a phenomenon of the human being everywhere in the world. I'm looking last night at my television and seeing what is happening in Ecuador where prisoners there, about 10,000 of them have taken over the jail. The government, according to the report I saw on the BBC last night, has lost control of that jail. I've seen in Sweden recently, the prime minister of Sweden had to bring out the army to deal with gangland activity there. I saw the recently, last year, the president of El Salvador having to build a special jail for gangsters across, and I understand he has inside of there about 65,000 of them. I understand that governments all over the world, little St. Vincent, little St. Lucia, St. Lucia had about 76 murders for 2023. Idyllic, beautiful, quiet St. Lucia. It's all around the place in the United States, in the United Kingdom. This is the reality of the human being who it appears is not getting better. Trinidad and Tobago is not spared of that. So we, like every other country, pay attention to our borders as an island state. We have taken action to improve um, our border arrangements. Uh, as we discussed on the last occasion, we have taken action to quicken the criminal justice system in Trinidad and Tobago. We have taken action to improve. Only yesterday, I delivered a FITI address at the graduation of another 37 officers from across national security who engaged for the last nine months in some specific training in crime scene investigation, surveillance techniques, crime scene management, those kinds of specialist skills. They would be the last 37 of approximately 5,200 officers across the services, law enforcement family, who would have had this specialist training to improve their capacity and capability, to improve their professionalism, so as to give you, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, that when you have a problem with crime and criminality and one of our officers shows up, he's on the streets while you are in distress, whatever the contact, he has the capacity and he is imbued with the passion to want to solve your problem. It is that which this training was about. And I delivered the FITI address to them and pointed out to them that, you know, using um, the metaphor of a song, now that you found love, what are you going to do with it? I pointed out to them that having this training, being more professional, your resume enhanced, your capacity to contribute to your organization is indeed enhanced. But all of that would be of no value if you are not present. So I bore down, bore down upon them to be present 24 hours a day. Well, of course, the police commissioner would organize the deployment of her troops and the chief of defense staff and the immigration chief and all of that. But the idea is that we be present, we be responsive 24 hours a day as you, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, need them. I pointed out to them that all of this training would come to naught if they are not people of integrity who will use the acquisition of this knowledge and training and skill to the benefit and to the good of Trinidad and Tobago rather than use it as unfortunately some have used it against the better pathway that we expect. And of course, I raised with them the question of accountability, as you would have seen arising out of the recent incident at the mega store, arising out of the recent incident in Karanaj, where two people lost their lives in a domestic confrontation with one of our personnel. There is going to be accountability. You act in accordance with the law, you act in accordance with the constitution, you act in accordance with your oath, you act in accordance with your standing orders, and you are all well, good, and fine. You have the full support of the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago. But of course, if you go outside of that and act otherwise, then accountability will be the order of the day. But I celebrated the 37 of them. They were all very enthusiastic, 
ready and raring to go. And this is what we try to do by providing these opportunities for training, opportunities for the acquisition of best practice law enforcement techniques. And um, we were all elated at, the, at, at, at those facts. As we are on the topic of crime, we've already seen a number of murders and we're already two weeks into the year. Um, January tends to be one of those, according to historical data, one that has a high murder count. Has any analysis done on why this is? Yes, uh, Sunil, we do collect data and there are highly skilled analysts inside of the police service and law enforcement more generally. So we do look at the figures and understand what they mean at any point in time. And you are quite right. January, for some reason that I cannot explain, features high numbers of murders. I've seen figures in recent years like 53, 60. So I think yesterday I had a conversation with the Commission of Police and I think we are about 18 so far for this year, though today is just the 12th of January and um, all the systems and all the measures are in place to suppress that because we are hoping, one, that the people of Trinidad and Tobago and on a few rare occasions, people who visit here will not manifest the level of violence that they do. Police cannot be everywhere. Uh, some of these take place in people's domesticity. A lot of these murders last year, we found that as many as, I think, 48 murders were as a result of petty altercations. Two people arguing in a bar on a street corner, sometimes inside of a house. You mash somebody's nice sneakers, topple somebody's drink accidentally, a minor accident when both people are fully insured and it ends up in a fatality. That kind of behavior on the part of human beings, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and as I say, sometimes our visitors, is to be uh, deprecated. If we hadn't these petty altercations which led to 48 murders, 576 last year would have been substantially less. And then of course, we had 261 of them arising out of gangland behavior. I have had opportunity to speak to gang members, admitted gang members to me over the years as a member of parliament, as a practicing attorney at law, as minister of national security with responsibility for the prison, having visited, counseled young men, you know, chatted with some of them. And 261 lives was lost to gangland activity last year. In many cases, they don't know what they are fighting for. Some of them call it a war, and I always tell them that ain't no war. War is often over land. War is often between armies. War is a, a, a issues over political ideology, oil and gas. What you are fighting for, because you call yourself six, and you call yourself seven, and you call yourself ABG, and you call yourself some little something, it's empty. And it's a painful loss. If only they would gang up and do the right thing, gang up at the University of the West Indies, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, COSTAT, the Laventil Technology and Continuing Education Center, which we put inside of Laventil, if you would gang up on the University of London in January and in June and hit them seven passes, or if you would gang up at the MIC and get training in welding, engineering, all the skill training that is available for you, the young people of Trinidad and Tobago, we'd all be much better off. Many times they come, their parents come, to the members of parliament to ask to get help from the Ministry of Social Development to attend to their funeral services. The family just don't have. 261 we lost in those circumstances. We lost 60 people last year arising out of robberies. So somebody decided that what you have should be theirs. I'm not going to work. 
I'm not going to use the gifts that God gave to me, including two hands. And you don't even need two hands to work. There's a young lady in this country called Vera Bajan. She's an attorney at law. I celebrated her when she re- back in the 1990s. An outstanding personality. She was born with no hands. She learned to write with her toes on her feet. Today, she's an attorney at law using the brain that God gave to her. So it demonstrates that you don't even have to have hand. You just have to have the spirit of goodness and the will. And you have a country that has provided opportunities for all, whether you are physically impaired, whether you are a slow learner. I tell you this, using my own example, Sunil, I left secondary school having failed my first attempt at SEA having succeeded on the second attempt. I went to secondary school for five years like most of you and left secondary school with one CXC pass with a grade five. But I didn't stop there. My father, may his soul rest in peace, came to me and asked me, what do I want to do? My mother was already directing me to go and learn a trade because she said, the boy like you don't have no ability to get nothing academic. With love in her heart, she thought that, but she was wrong. People learn at different rates. People perform differently at different times. But my father, who was an unlettered, third standard educated man, wolf man, he asked me what I wanted to do. I told him I wanted to repeat some of them subjects. He immediately told me, find him the following morning, because we didn't live in the same household. I grew up in a single parent household too. And he gave me the $78.26 that the Ministry of Education said I must pay to write the two subjects. And I signed up for them. And so the story went. Today, you don't even have to pay for those extra subjects. If you left school in June, May, June, and you want to write CXEs in January, you get them at no cost to yourself. The state pays every cent. All you have to pay is attention. So I went, I paid some attention, and I got my subjects. I did my A-levels. I eventually left the police service, left the insurance industry, went to London, got my law degree, got my master's degree, got called to the Bath Middle Temple, came back to Trinidad and Tobago with a spirit of public service inside of me, and I've been serving Trinidad and Tobago as a member of parliament since 1995. Demonstrating from my own example, you don't have to rob, you don't have to thief, you don't have to cheat to be a winner. You can without all of that. So the 60 lives we lost on account of robberies because somebody decided, I wouldn't go and learn no trade. I wouldn't learn to trim nobody. I wouldn't learn to cut a piece of cloth. I wouldn't learn to pong a nail, to make a gate, to make a door, to fix a car, to change oil in a motor car. Instead, I must go and take what somebody else has. And unfortunately, in those circumstances, either your victim gets killed or you get killed in the process. And so we looked on with horror at the 586 murders that we sustained last year. We are now at about 18, which is about comparative to previous years, year to date. And the commissioner in my discussion with her and the chief of defense staff have vowed to use all of their resources, everything that is available to them to suppress the bad behavior of those who generate the murders that we count on a daily basis. And while that is happening, other areas of the government, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Social Development, the Ministry of Housing, continue to do what we have to do in an understanding that we must treat with the totality of the human being And we call on the parents, we call on the faith-based organizations, we call on the adults in communities to be the change that you want to see. Be the best examples for the young people who need them. Do whatever you can to assist and support and nurture and guide our young people away from a pathway of self-destruction and pain and trauma to the rest of the society. It's all here. You just have to reach out and touch. I just want to get back to Carnival in terms of what is being done to ensure the safety of both masqueraders and spectators for Carnival 2024. You know, I did indicate earlier the measures that are being implemented have already been implemented. 
in order to ensure that um, there's presence, there's responsiveness, there's continued collaboration between all of the stakeholders, there's tremendous collaboration between the units of national security, the fire service, which has a role to play in terms of public safety. Um, we have put a system in place even to regulate the numbers of people who go to particular venues. It is a fact that promoters in their aspiration to make plenty money can sell more tickets. It happened, you know, at the National Stadium back in 1989 before many of the citizens present were, were born. We had an overcrowding at the stadium at a football game. And um, even that we have paid some attention to. We have worked out a formula with the promoters where there will be a head count. So we'll have clearly a number of persons who will go to each event. And at that point, no more would be permitted in, in the interest of public safety. As I said, heightened presence using the specialist agencies of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the deployment of many more personnel from the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, and all the other, the use of the CCTV cameras, greater use of those, and of course, targeting known and prolific offenders, as the police call them. There are some persons who are known to the police, repeat offenders, prolific offenders. It is part of the plan to focus on them and to keep them at bay in the interest of public safety. And I'm looking forward to the conglomeration of all of these. And I expect a nice and safe and enjoyable carnival 2024. After everything is said and done, are there any specific indicators to rate if it was a successful carnival in terms of security? Well, the public would judge. I know that we look at the events, the incidents of crime around carnival. Those would be collated and those would be analyzed and commented upon. But altogether, we have had decades of happy and generally safe carnivals in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm confident that 2024 in that sense would be no different. What can individuals do to ensure their own safety during the carnival period, including fat goers, masqueraders, spectators, all the like? Well, I have noticed that the police service have been giving regular tips in different ways through different means uh, to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. But I would say in answer to your question, it's basically a common sense thing. Listen to your spirit. If your vibe tell you don't go there, don't go there. Don't leave your car door swinging wide open and go someplace else. When you come back, you probably not find it. Secure your keys. Don't walk around with things in your hand like I saw a lady the other day, she was walking apparently with her daughter. I was driving behind them and she had a cellular phone in one hand and a little bag on a very thin string walking happily along. So I had one of the officers have a quick word with her and tell her in this zone that appears to be like an advertisement. Use common sense. That's why you have back straps, put them over your arm. And, you know, make, just make the fences a little taller. Lock your doors. Do the things that people would normally do to ensure your own safety. And if you follow the regular beaten tracks, you'll be all right. In every city of the world, there are some hot spots. If you confine yourself to the areas where you are advised that you can safely go, all will be well anywhere in the world. But if you decide that you want to go to the sleazy parts at some sleazy kind of hours, you expose the probability and the risk of harm and danger coming to you. So it's largely a common sense thing the police service and the fire service are offering tips on an ongoing basis. And I believe that um, 
people will continue to act sensibly to protect themselves because you are the first police officer. You have to know what you're dealing with. Minimize aggravation and argument. There's an accident. You don't have to argue with the other driver. Exchange information and documents and go to the nearest police station and report it as the law and the regulations expect you to do. But if you're going to start up some big argument and become irritable, and the other person become irritable, and somebody go for their cutlass, somebody go for a bottle, somebody go for a gun, well, we have a problem. So common sense, good sense, good civil and social behavior and conduct, follow the law, and all will be well. Earlier, you talked about the police service having a full complement of police officers for Carnival. I know every year we, we talk about this in terms of, uh, you know, police officers coming out on duty for Carnival and uh, not being somewhere else. Um, any message to them? Well, the Commission of Police and the Chief of Defence Staff will, as usual, deploy their troops, who, as disciplined personnel, will comply with the directions given by their leaders. And they have been doing that for as long as I know. I was a police officer as well. I worked for many, many carnivals and, and, and was quite happy doing it. I have no reason to think that that would they, cease. The Promoters Association uh, has been very vocal in terms of security and the money they pay for security uh, for events, fets, and so on. Um, I know you had a sta stakeholder discussion with them. Was this issue brought up? Yes, it was central to some of the discussions we've had and a formula has been worked out. Um, the court has a role to play in this when a promoter is having an event. He indicates to the, the court how many tickets he's about to sell and that gives the court an idea as to how many people would be in that particular venue. Once that is clear, then the fire service, looking on at public safety as it must, and the police service, also looking on at law and order as it must, they will then indicate to the court what they believe should be the presence, the strength, as we call it, present at these events to properly ensure safety and to police the event. And therefore, they have worked out a formula in this MOU I spoke about, and they've worked out a system of counting. So essentially it will be, I propose to have an event at a particular venue, the fire service will determine professionally what is the capacity that that venue can handle. That will be made known to the court. The promoter will indicate how many tickets he intends to sell, how many staff members he would have there, and therefore we'll have a good idea of the number of people that would be at that venue. The court will be so informed. Once that is done, then the police will then decide recommend how many police officers and the fire service, how many fire officers it will take to man and to properly police these events. The court will be so informed. An agreement will be struck in the court and everyone would live by that. If the promoter decides that he, in the interest of income generation, want to double the figure and people show up at the gate, the police in that arrangement understand that they will not allow one other person to enter there. If you have a bona fide ticket and you can't get in for that reason, then your issue is with the promoter. It's a contractual arrangement. He took your money and you are unable to pay, uh, he's unable to accommodate you. Well, one expects that he will do the right thing in that regard. That's a matter for you and the contractor. But from a law enforcement standpoint and a public safety standpoint, so it will be. So that basically is the formula that they have worked out. So the issue you have raised about the number of police and all that was sorted out inside of that. And I heard from the promoters and from the police that they are quite happy with the formula that they have put together. And I'm looking forward to it working in a sensible and, and, and satisfying manner to all concerned. On the issue of crime again, we recently saw crime infiltrating a uh, long circular mall, public space. Is there any concern about this? Well, yes, everywhere other than in your domesticity or in your business place is a public place. A public place is really defined uh, at least um, uh, as a place where the public has access, whether on payment or otherwise. So that 
Mall is a public place. And all most of the other parts of Trinidad and Tobago are public places when you really think about it. So it is a concern to us. And this is why the police have reacted in the way they have and must continue to react in terms of presence across Trinidad and Tobago. But they can't be everywhere. And therefore, they deploy as best as they can, respond to the citizens' call and need as best as they can. And of course, the citizens has a responsibility to act in a social and civil manner, resolve any disputes that might arise in a social and civil manner, rather than yield to violence, which is far too often the case. So that incident at the Long Circular Mall, a very public place, a very matter, a matter of great concern to law enforcement. And I am aware that thorough investigations are underway. Now, Minister, the number of murders for the year so far have already exceeded the amount of days uh, we're into. Uh, is there any concern in terms of uh, concern for people in terms of their, their losing faith in the, or trust in, in the police service? Any concern about that? Of course we are concerned. Public trust and confidence are essential ingredients in successful policing. I told you a moment ago, the police cannot be everywhere. They cannot know everything. It is Shakespeare who said there is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. You cannot even tell what is in the mind of your wife if you look at her beautiful face or your brother. And therefore, sometimes we are coming from behind, only responding after the deed is done. It is very few people who tell you that they are going to do what they eventually did. So the police is in that sense, the criminals has at his advantage the element of surprise. He chooses when and where he would launch his attack. So it is about responsiveness. It is about flexibility. It is about solving the problem once it arises. Public trust and confidence is critical in the context of successful policing, as I said, because it is the information that comes from the public. So the police service is acutely aware that they have to act and operate in a manner that wins public trust and confidence. Confidence not only in matters of integrity, but confidence in matters of their competence and ability to solve crimes, which is why we had the training program and we have hundreds of training programs for police officers and law enforcement on an ongoing basis to improve their professional capacity so that you, the citizens, will know they have the capacity to fix the problem that you have asked them to address. The crime symposium we had in 2023, has anything yielded from that so far? Of course, there's tremendous collaboration within CARICOM. Since then, we have established the CARICOM Gang and Intelligence Unit which is a sharing platform for the countries of CARICOM. Coming out of that symposium, we all realized, concretized our understanding that we all suffer the same problems, meaning the importation of guns from the United States into our islands, our space, and the mayhem and the murders that flow as a result of it. There has been tremendous collaboration with our international partners, all of whom were well represented and present at this, that symposium, which diverted into a new pathway, a new philosophy in treating with crime and violence, where we began and announced that day we will henceforth treat it as a public health concern, the way we treated COVID-19. So I have found in Trinidad and Tobago as Minister of National Security that I have had active, passioned support of all the countries of the world represented in Trinidad and Tobago and all of the international organizations. Since that symposium, every one of the ambassadors and high commissioners present in Trinidad and Tobago, I can bear testimony, have come alive collaborating with us, the government and national security, making their contribution, making available assets, equipment, advice, support, best practice exposure 
for our personnel. So that is one of the benefits that stronger relations within CARICOM. We have designed the CARICOM warrant now, where if someone in any one of our states is wanted by law enforcement in any one of these states, you don't need no special extradition arrangement to bring him back to Trinidad and Tobago or vice versa. The CARICOM warrant is a solution to that. We have made that progress as well. And therefore, a lot has been done since that symposium. The government itself taking violence as a public health concern. We have accentuated the things that we have on offer other than through law enforcement. I'm talking about in education, in sport and community development in housing, in the Ministry of Social Development, in all the other ministries, the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service designed to deal with approximately 498,000 citizens in this country between the ages of 10 and 35. We have accentuated all that we have on offer in the understanding that we must address the totality of the human being. All NGOs get state support when they need it, assuming that they make the right approaches. And of course, the faith-based organizations as well. The government sponsors and supports the work of many of these organizations in an understanding that we must address the totality of the human being, his spirit, his mind, his physical well-being, his housing accommodation, the community in which he lives, all of that, the provision of internet service across Trinidad and Tobago, so he has access to what is happening everywhere in the globe. I mean, arising out of that symposium, there has been a regeneration of ideas, a more impassioned approach to dealing with the thing, and um, I am quite optimistic about the future as a result. Prison officers who may be concerned for their safety, can you tell us what is being done? Well, prison officers face the brunt of a lot of the violence and the violent thoughts that permeate this society. They are responsible for holding and treating the people who the courts remand or sentence the terms of imprisonment for their sinfulness, their wickedness, their selfishness, some of which we call crime, for which they were convicted. So prison officers have to deal with them on a daily basis. While many of you in the society avoid them, run from them, don't want to see them, prison officers are mandated by their duty to deal with them. And therefore, for that reason, prison officers have come under their attention, attack, and innocent, hardworking prison officers, for no other reason than having carried out their oath and observed the law, have lost their lives in this country, a matter of serious concern for us. And we have been doing what we have to do to provide protection and safety to our officers while we take other action to suppress the behaviors of those who would do it. So the answer to your question is indubitably yes. Your final thoughts? I am hoping that as we improve our techniques, as we improve the laws, as we improve the swiftness of the criminal justice system, as we improve all that we offer from law enforcement, and we have offered and we have done much, I'm hoping that the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago will demonstrate among themselves, in their families, in their communities, in contact with others on the streets, higher levels of civility and good behavior. Be your brother's keeper. Don't draw your sword so swiftly and fling stones. Drink your porridge cool, take it down. There are many other places and circumstances that you can resolve your differences. And I believe that if the society cooperates better with law enforcement, share information, identify wrongdoing in your homes, wrongdoing and illegality in your communities so that law enforcement can treat with it, I believe all of these things, working together, coming together, can create a gentler and kinder and more productive and happier platform that is Trinidad and Tobago. 
for my own part, I am absolutely optimistic about it. Minister, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I know crime and security is always a hot topic, so we would have to have you back in 2024 sometime again. Uh, but thanks for, thanks for joining us on this show uh, once again. Thank you very, very, very much, Mr. Lala. Pleasure was mine. Join us at the same time next week for another episode of Delving Deeper. I am Sonolala, and on behalf of the entire group, have a great night. Thank you.